Welcome, everybody, to our Wednesday night extravaganza here at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Quick Fix Golf at quickfixgolf.com. And we have a special guest tonight, and that's John Sinclair, PGA professional. How about a round of applause? Yay, you got to clap. Yay, John. <laughs> So well, it's John, glad to be. I'm glad to be here. So thanks for having me. We're glad you're here. And of course, there's the group I was telling you about. Isn't that your gang, or they're just students? Oh, uh, it's a big gang of friends. We did the uh, that picture's from the uh, Torques and Forces from uh, Dr. Phil Cheatham and Dr. Sasha McKenzie, and I did some wedge stuff that day, and we all got together and just went crazy inside my bay so that's what that picture's from well it looks great and your website looks great sinclairgolf.com you want to find out more about john as we go along you'll we'll see you now of course tonight's going to be hosted by darren demaley i don't know if you've ever seen darren before but there's a oh, picture of him man, you got a good picture of him. yeah that's a good picture right there i have a few few less teeth in that picture now but and, and i yeah, had to yank black. a few yeah, and I tried to buy your black, so. That'll teach you to say yes to somebody that you don't even know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> All right, wow. go ahead, Darren. I'm Darren DeMaley. And I'm Bobby Lopez. And we're, and the, we're the PGA, PGA pros, pros at Tupelo Bay. Bay. It's hard doing it. He's in Myrtle Beach, and I'm in Virginia right closer, now. Though. It gets getting there. Thinking it up every week. Go ahead, Darren. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to get your cell phone out. I want you to take a video of your golf swing and send it to us for a free analysis. Send it to quick service at quickfixgolf.com. And it's not a penny out of your pocket. We'll send you back an analysis with the drill personalized just for you. That's sort of what it'll look like. And we're now going to be having these webinars that we're holding right now. We're going to be holding, in fact, just did one this evening, a little earlier from Texas. Uh, no, not Texas. We're in Texas now. Um, Arizona. So uh, we're going to be doing them all over the place, including Mexico. So now you don't have to jump the fence to get qualified instruction. We'll bring it to you. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you get a kick out of that, John. Anyway, this right here, I guess, did I steal this from your website or, or was this hack motion? Uh, it's not mine, so it must be a hack motion. Well, see if you agree with this. The play consistent golf, you need to achieve consistent contact at the club face and the ball. So... You go ahead and 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 and, and wail on on what you you've studied, and I know Darren's real interested in everything that has to do with your wrist action and what have you. So let me turn you loose. Well, certainly on the wrist angles, that's uh, extremely important, and uh, I've done a lot of research on it. I've captured on 3D, gosh, over a hundred tour players now. I probably have one of the best databases in the world as far as that goes, and. So I get to look at a lot of tour players. I get to work with a lot of great coaches and players. And so uh, the wrist angles obviously is very important. And just recently, I or last year, I guess it was, I spoke at the uh, teaching coaching summit and really just covered the transition in a foot. And we had a huge crowd there and they asked me to uh, create a wrist angle video. And actually I did it. And it took me about six months and it's two and a half hours. So I did the from the address all the way back to uh, the finish and uh, put it all together because people seemed interested and there really wasn't anything out there. And um, now you have hack motion stuff up here um, now, which has made a pretty good splash here over the last year. And so people are getting really interested in, in wrist angles. And I've done all my work with AMM. It's where I capture all my information, and then I train with 4D motion. And, of course, hack motion is very similar technology, and it's uh, really good for training. It's, it's quick. They're easy. Um, good for training. When I want to do it uh, precisely and exact, that's when I use my AMM. And so you put up here, you put up uh, just the different movements that we capture, um, ext extension and flexion. That's a good video of that. And a lot of people uh, really work through that and they start to understand. And that's really where the motion is in the wrist, is that flexion extension. Radial deviation and ulnar deviation, the up and down motion, there's not a lot of actual movement there. Um, you've got like 25 degrees. We'll just 
round it to 25 degrees either direction in radial deviation and ulnar. Radial's a little bit shorter, and then ulnar you can get a tad bit more for most players. But extension, when you go back over to extension, when you're extending, you can get a lot more radial deviation as it's recorded on your different devices that you use. And then when you go into flexion, you can add a lot more ulnar. So those are interconnected uh, when you start to look at your 3D. And when we look at some of the graphs, I think you pulled up. We'll look at some of those as well. And then you go back to that other slide, go back there. So we still have let the- go, Let me go back previous. Yeah, uh, go back to the rotation and that's supination and pronation where it says rotation down there. So I think this must be a hack motion um, slide right here. So they're just measuring what they would probably call rotation. So it's, it's probably not as accurate as what I do and even what I do with 4D because you actually need three sensors to get a really accurate motion and then call it uh, pronation and supination. So if you take your thumbs out and put them right in front of you pointing up, you can make sure that if you turn them in towards each other, your thumbs in towards each other, then both of your arms will be pronating. And what you would be looking at and what I measure in AMM and 40 motion is from the elbow joint and how much that forearm is rotating. So if you turn your thumbs in, that's pronation. If you turn your thumbs out away from each other where your palms are facing up, that's supination. So I think hack motion has got something in there that's doing rotation. So those numbers aren't gonna match uh, the things that I do because that rotation could involve the shoulder or the forearm from about what I can gather of what they have. So that's just something to look for if you're using a hack motion versus if you're looking at my data from AMM or even any of my data from uh, 4D motion. So you can flip it now. I put a couple of questions here before we get started on the graphs. Say, how would you describe how the wrist would hinge on the backswing? Drag the head back first, leading with the grip, sort of like Bernhard Langer, you know, he drags the head across the grass. Roll your hands clockwise to open the club face. Hinge the right hand so the palm is facing down to the ground or none of the above. Um, I would not describe it like that at all. So none of the above for me. Good. Um, doesn't mean any of that's <laughs> none of, doesn't mean any of that's wrong. It's just not how I would say it. But well, I made um, these I, up to be wrong. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why I put. So I, I don't think I would say any of those things uh, necessarily. You know, to a client right there. But um, I look at it and I take this actually in my video. I take this. Uh, and I go step by step through this. So as you take the club away, if we look at the lead hand, in every player I've ever measured, that lead hand will go in towards flexion at the initial takeaway. So we get a little bit of flexion, so a little bit of bowing of the left, of the lead wrist, and a little bit of extension. Who's a of player? The trail you, wrist. Who's a player that you would you would describe that for? You want Johnson? anybody? Johnson. You want Johnson? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's go to Dustin Johnson here. I mean, All he'll right. be a little bit different. So, you know, just taking back to Club Parallel. So in that motion right there, you're going to see that lead wrist will go towards flexion, certainly a lot for him, and then his trail wrist is going towards extension. And while that's happening, both wrists are going up towards uh, radial deviation to the top. And then as most players move towards the top, they start to head again, lead wrist into a little bit of extension. And when I say head towards, that's the movement towards. That doesn't mean the position. The title of my uh, video is called, it's the motion, not the position. So when we get to the top, go ahead, what's the question? So the question was, is that, is that the video that we, you were selling for 149 on your site? Correct. And then yes. we'll give everybody a $50 off code here. Oh, too, so. fantastic. Okay, great. So stay, stay on, guys, and listen to what's going on here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go? Yeah. So when we go to the top there, you'll, you'll see your lead wrist go towards 
a little bit more extension, head towards that motion. Now he's obviously in flexion at the top, stay at the top before we go back down. And then we go to extension with the trail wrist, his right hand there. So that's that motion towards the top. And you'll have a Dustin Johnson that's in huge flexion. And then you'll have a uh, Webb Simpson that'll be in a massive amount of extension at the top. And keep in mind for everybody out there listening that to me, that lead wrist at the top is style. So we'll have, I think my, my biggest extension is probably around 50 degrees of extension at the top. So imagine, you know, that's a, a pretty extended lead wrist. And then my biggest flexion is around 40 degrees. So this is my tour database and we'll have, a 90 degree separation in that whole database and and then the actual standard deviation is probably somewhere around um bow i would say about seven to eight degrees extended to about uh just zero so if you're sitting there teaching somebody like dustin johnson and you're teaching them to go into flexion you're actually in an outlier position so my database has 100 people. You can imagine if it has 100, it's at more than 100, but we'll use 100 for the numbers, that I would only have 16 players that would have been what I would consider flexion, which would be plus five degrees of flexion. So think, you know, Dustin Johnson and the way that the whole world is going towards this flexion at the top, a John Rom or something like that, they're actually extreme outliers. Um, most players fall into a category of either a flat left, left wrist at the top to an extended wrist up to say, you know, seven, eight degrees, somewhere in that range. And don't quote me exactly on the numbers. There's a John Rom, another flex at the top. So he's a extreme outlier. Now, of course, as short as he takes it back, he'd better be in that position to get it back to square. And that's a, a pretty good idea for somebody that takes it so short to, have them push towards that flexion. But nobody talks about the trail wrist. And the trail wrist extension is actually about cuts that deviation number in half. So that's much more of a, of a more exact, I guess we could call it an exact number at the top. So the trail wrist, we're going to find a lot more, uh, you know, a tighter deviation for tour players than we'll ever find the lead wrist. So I just like to make sure that gets uh, really pointed out because the whole world is moving towards a flat left wrist at the top to a bowed left wrist at the top because we got all these good players at the top right now. And then you go back into the early 90s and the you know 80s and then beyond, and we had all this extension at the top winning. So you can win at both sides. You know, it's about matchups. Um, the lead wrist is definitely style when it comes to flexion extension. Now, when you come back to that radial ulnar at the top, the lead wrist, that, that'll be a much tighter number, a much tighter number. And then when you get to the trail wrist, that radial deviation and ulnar deviation will be more of a style because the elbow is going to be moving around. And, you know, you get, you know, John Rom right there has got his elbow more in front of him at the turn. And then you'll have somebody that's got their elbow back. And that's going to really affect that uh, trail wrist deviation on the radial owner side you can pull up just you know just anybody's got their their arm pulled back so if you can imagine when your arm gets out there and you know he's just a little bit more so as your arm gets more how that radial deviation in that trail wrist will change and how the flexion extension because that lead wrist is more in front and it kind of stays in the same place that's why those are going to be style versus uh, what I would call more exact number or, you know, a tighter correlation from player to player. And of course we've got uh, lots of uh, supination and pronation. We have the trail arm supinating on the way back and we have the lead forearm pronating on the way back up to the top. So that's kind of going the way that I would describe it to all these coaches on here of how that club gets to the top. So that the idea of the flexion extension. So 
we have guys here with hack motion you're just working with the lead wrist you're just talking about that lead wrist is going towards flexion initially then heading towards extension to the top then on the way down it's starting to head back towards flexion and then right around the club about 30 degrees before impact it's starting to go rapidly towards extension again Ooh. so that's how that lead wrist works through or i wanted to do this wait, wait, of course like so you're saying that you know this looks like a scoop yes so you're saying and after impact i mean you might have be bulged with the before left before impact it shoots it shoots so there's none of this you know you see all this stuff on the websites and on the uh, internet of everybody pass the ball in this massive amounts of of flexion and you know chances are if they're in a massive amount they probably hit the ground but if you didn't have that ground that that hand is going rapidly so if we took that picture that you have up there right now and that flexion to extension that's happening right through the ball so about 30 degrees i'd say to shaft about 30 degrees before the ball or or you know even shaft parallel just after that that hand is going to move towards flexion i mean towards extension you have to realize that you know a driver you're swinging 100 110 miles an hour that thing weighs 100 pounds who's going to be able to hold that off you know so if you look at somebody that's wrist is in you know pretty good amount of flexion and impact if you looked one frame back it's in more flexion than where it was when you saw it so I that, got you. that wrist is really moving towards extension doesn't mean it gets to extension someone like a a webb simpson or a uh let's say a you know anybody carl peterson you know with a really strong grip they're never going to get to flexion at impact well like and this one right have, here because it's so shut he is it looks like he's leading with the back of his left hand, but you're saying right there it's already released. Yeah, he's released it a long time before that. Yeah, so go back up a little bit. So I'd say go down shaft parallel. So probably anywhere from right there to maybe one click further. That arm, that you know, right in there, maybe just one click further, then that thing's going to really head towards extension um, right there. That's extending the whole way. I have one player in my entire database that I've ever recorded that actually kept his hand moving towards flexion through impact. And I'm not so sure that's not an error in the system. Still to this day, I'm, I'm, I have a hard time believing it, but you know, it does show it and I feel like it's pretty good, but it's one person out of 120 tour players and then every single other amateur i've ever captured <laughs> they all move towards extension through impact so i don't like my players feeling like they hold anything off or try to get to a bowed position or something like that in impact i'm going to check their grip i'm going to look at the way that that relationship is at the top with their forearm if you can go back to somebody down the line and go to the top of their swing. No, this is a weird one, but. That's okay. So I'm gonna, I have a, and so he'd be at the, at the top end of my, what people would call closed face. But see that relationship with his wrist and the forearm, it's gonna match up. He's gonna be able to handle that because he can turn. So if this, if, you know, if you're looking at a player there and he's in that position and they can't get open, they can't turn, they can't right side bend, they're in big trouble right there. But you have this, you know, you know, superhuman specimen right there. He's in pretty good shape where he's at. And then, you know, all the way to where the toe would maybe match the forearm, maybe on a flatter player or something like that, that toe of the club matching their forearm. So there's a pretty good sized area that I would give a tolerance to at the top of the swing and certainly nobody would need to to look exactly the same but my telltale sign is can this player control face path relationship and if they can then they probably got in a pretty good spot up at the top if they can't then that's something we probably address through grip through the top of the swing or just simple rate of closure ideas to you know slow it down or speed it up depending on uh what the player's having the trouble with darren you got any questions 
Yeah, I do, John. Um, all interesting information, but um, you know, on a daily basis, the first move at the top of the swing for most people that I teach is an extension move. Hundred um, percent. And it's just it's it's a very tough thing to teach. Uh, it, it's very difficult to get the students to understand that, and that's why I think some of the things you do provide great feedback and 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 can expedite that learning process. What you got any advice there? Yeah, it's 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 a generation plus. So we're going to say probably the last four to five generations have been taught lag. And uh, let's just go to somebody face on, and. Uh, who do you want? You name them. It, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't. It makes zero difference. Any play, any my good buddy, player is going to be good. Right? <laughs> there you go. Get a little better face on. Get a little, little straighter on picture. Okay. How's that? There you go. Perfect. So let's go to the top. So what what people will do, and if you can even draw a line down the shaft, down their right arm, the right forearm. So what most people will look at, and they'll try to increase that number in a two-dimensional video and the easiest way for an amateur to do that would be to extend his lead wrist and pull the club down and so you just bring this player down like three clicks they go to arm parallel be fine so bring this player and then you can go back up one there you go now draw that line on there you can put there if you had angles you could draw it on there so the whole world would be looking at that and going oh my gosh he's holding the lag he's he's doing all this and so this generational thing that's just gone ever since we've had video players try to match that look and they just do it wrong um joe mayo and i did a, a study because we were arguing over wrist angles one time and so i went out to vegas and and uh we captured all of these amateurs players from scratch players up to you know 9500 shooters that never had lessons and 100 percent of them increased that extension from the top of their swing to right there where that player is and this is where they start to close the club face and it was all of them and then all of the pros and even the scratch player did it but all of the pros they all have moved for the most part in this this case some do it a little bit after the transition but it's it's no way within about two or three clicks of this camera before they're moving towards flexion so this player clearly moved towards flexion and what he did with his trail wrist is he extended it and it's very highly possible you're not going to be able to see it too much in 2d but probably both of his wrists at some point there headed towards a little bit of uh, ulnar deviation so he casted the club a little bit he extended the right wrist flexed the left wrist and that creates this lag picture and it truly will increase that angle between that club and your forearm and when you pull it down like an amateur do you have any amateurs on here you can do down down the line right try that one all right now go to the top of the swing and do a side by side with a pro don't bring up dustin just do one that's more reason more uh normal like a flat less brisk guy or even extended well how about him again yeah that's fine there you go and take him to the top and so he's an extension a little bit at the top now click him down a little bit and who, uh, Watch his club, Immelman, on the right. Now, notice, stop right there. Go back up and repeat it, and watch that club head, how it goes up, back, behind him. See that right there? So that's showing the move I'm talking about. So if you look at this down the line and you get a camera up by the, up by the hands, and this is a great picture, you'll see that club head, and it's the center of mass, going behind the player and up. So run that one more time on Immelman. And this is where everybody's talking about, you know, shallowing club. This is where he shallowed it, in my opinion, right there. And that's about all he's going to do about to that point. And now he's going to start tipping it up. Now run the amateur. 
and you'll probably see him. I don't know who this player is, but you'll probably see him pull that club down and extend. And that club gets, yeah, you can clearly see that do that again. Go up to the top in his transition. And then you'll see that club never went behind him. So that's going to be my telltale sign that that person is not closing the club face. And what you'll hear me say is at the top, I want you to close the club face early so you don't have to close it late. And well, John, Emelman, you know what? yes, You've sir. Made Bobby and I look very smart tonight because we That's say good. that all the time. That's <laughs> good. The story about Nicholas that you had with that with that guy. Yeah, I, I worked for Nicholas for seven years, and and Jack, what are you talking? That's why he's like about. a picture that we had on there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, had, I had more hair and teeth back then. But Jack would always talk about, um, you know, the rotation of the face starting, you know, as soon as he moved to the left side. Uh, Mike Malaska, Jim Flick, all, all those guys really helped me understand what was going on up there. And, um, and, um, and now you can measure it. You know, there wasn't any measurement back then. That was, that was probably 1999-2000. But uh, now we can measure all this, so we don't have to guess about it anymore. And that's that's what uh, really intrigues me. No, and you you can when you're flexing your wrist, okay. So it doesn't matter if you're extended, like you know Trevor was there. He was extended, and and it doesn't matter as long as it's moving towards flexion. You're closing the club face. If you look at the gentleman on the left, he's clearly either holding it. It's hard to see on video unless we get a camera right there. He's clearly either holding it in its position or he's actually well you can see right there he opened it so that toe went wide open all the way to there he hasn't even closed it yet so he's in big trouble right he's got to do the hand you know get the hand steep stand up i don't even have you know you know what's about to happen you know any chance of him getting that club square and think about right there he's at what 90 degrees to the target to the face you know, he's got to go 90 degrees from that point and tell him, bring uh, Immelman down. Look look at his left wrist right there. Yeah, it's still ex it's extended. He never really – he'll move it now. And now you see Immelman one more – yeah, see how he's already got the toe on the other side. And he's probably not even got it closed a huge amount, but you can certainly see his wrist. And bring the other guy down. Yeah, but look, look how and when he his, goes the ball, look how much he's turning over. Here. Oh, yeah. Turn it over Here. big time. Look where the club Yeah, he's in. toast, right? So he's doing everything he can. Now, here's them throw everybody into a tizzy. Immelman on the right has a slower rate of closure release than the guy on the left. I'd bet my life on it. And that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, this is the one, you know, when you're trying to hold that, you know, face to the plane and – or, you know, Jim Hardy says, you know, that that's zero rate of closure when it's to the path. I'm mean, just here to tell you that can't happen. It's not a functional golf swing. You have to have some rate of closure. The lowest rate of closure number that I've ever received, uh, the shaft is twisting at impact around 600 to 680 degrees per second. And then some some of the players go up to, you know, 1700 to 2000 so you know that that's a lot of movement and we only get that point zero 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 four five seconds to touch the ball let's get to some of these graphs here because that might help them better understand what you're saying mm -hmm. uh so that's an amm graph so that's uh, the one that i'm very familiar with the one on the left is the lead wrist and the one on the right is the trail wrist um, for those hack motion users, you'll see the green flexion on the left is the, the graph that you're used to seeing on the lead wrist. That one right there would be upside down uh, on hack motion. Now, the reason why we put this in uh, the order that it did where the actual graph is upside down to hack motion and hack motions is scientifically correct, I'll say that. But the reason we do that is we like to see the humps go in order. 
And this one's a little bit off. You know, if I was going to look at this one just a little bit off, I mean, it's probably a good player there. Um, I don't even – this looks like that might be one of my graphs where I always cut the names off of it. But you'll see the hump happen um, on the – lead wrist that green and it's happening before impact and you can see it start to go towards uh extension very rapidly and he's got quite a bit of flexion whoever this is got quite a bit of flexion um not much or any radial deviation in the lead wrist so you got a bunch of flexion at the top so this is a player that's in flexion at the top they don't have a lot of radial deviation so of course you couldn't you know, if you're in a bunch of flexion, you're not going to see a lot of radial deviation. And then you see that blue graph, which is rapidly, rapidly through impact supinating. So that's the arm going from pronation to supination. And from the looks of this particular graph, this player is uh, pretty fast. And probably I would be, my guess would be a short, I, this is no way this is one of my graphs because I haven't seen this and I would, I'm going to lay this graph and make it look like probably I'm going to guess somebody that looks about like John Rom. I would, I would say that's what that graph's going to look like. Um, a short swing with a lot of uh, flexion and then that huge move towards flexion on the way down and then releasing it and not much radial deviation at all. None on that swing. And then you look at the right wrist. Uh, you're seeing that extension I was talking about right off the ball with the right side on the trail wrist. Again, not very much radial deviation. This is going to lead me to believe that there's uh, a little bit of a shorter swing and certainly a huge layoff. And this is, you know, some assumptions that I make. And then you can see that his throwing motion's pretty short with that blue curve. So this has definitely got to be a pretty short swing. And then you see this this is a really telltale sign that i like people to understand just look at the two blue graphs that's supination and pronation so when those graphs are moving up those are supinating okay now think let your mind just sink into that both of those arms going into impact are supinating <laughs> okay so they're moving in an opposite direction. So what does that tell you? So if everybody out there on this webinar right now can put their hands together, and if you flex your lead wrist and extend your right wrist, you'll notice when you lay that club down like that in your hands that both of those forearms will actually supinate. And then you can see on the right side, it's like a pitcher's motion that right before impact, it goes massively to pronation. That graph turns around and goes the other way. Hopefully everybody can see that. And the lead wrist just keeps massively supinating all the way through impact. So definitely a pro player, a amateur, that left blue graph supination would be a much shallower curve, much slower um, move. But I would definitely throw this into a tour player um motion and i just i don't know who the tour player is but it has to be um pretty short and i'm looking at those uh numbers on that graph i'm not sure where you got that um but that you can see that top of that swing flexion yeah how about a lead daniel wrist berger. angle what's that how about a daniel berger yeah that's not daniel berger i know what that one looks like and that's not it he's got some different stuff but that's not a daniel berger so that's this, some four, right? that's a 4D uh, motion graph, but that's a kinematic sequence. So that's uh, the hips, the thorax, the pelvis, and the club, and that's the backswing. So that's uh, no wrist. That's not a wrist at all. That's the body. Well, the one good thing is you don't have to worry about keeping his head down. Yeah, exactly. Well, you can look at that and you can kind of see what I do in 4D motion, just so you know. And this is, goes for the wrist angles, too, just in that graph. So if you look at that red line, you see the line and then you got the vertical line and the horizontal line. Forget the curve. That's the mm -hmm. actual motion. And then you'll see a blue one. You see down there, you'll see a yellow one and then you see a green one. Well, that's my actual database. So that's the peak timing. So the peak timing of the pelvis is that red horizontal line. And then the peak speed would be the vertical line. 
And so anybody that's using 4D motion, my database is right there and you capture a swing, you can easily see if it's in the true range or not. So you can see that pelvis for this person is actually the timing of the peak is right in the right zone, but they're pretty fast hips. So they actually peak with a lot of speed in the backswing. And then you can see that the peaks of the thorax is the green line. That's right in the tour range. The arm is right in the tour range. And the club, um, it's pretty close. It peaks a little high, and it looks like it's pretty close to being in the tour range. So that's a, that's a one standard deviation of all the tour players that I have. And that's how you read it in 4D motion. And that's my ranges. So the wrists are like that same way. It'll do that uh, at different points of the swing. Now, what what is this contraption here? Is this the new K-Vest or something? Or No, no, no that's the AMM. So that's the uh, AMM. That's the one I use. So I'm capturing probably, oh, 220 measurements at 240 frames a second. So to me, that's the gold standard in 3D capture. It's the most accurate system. You can see I have the gears that's sitting up there behind him right there. Um, but I use this one to catch uh, all of my tour players, and that's Charles Howell, and that's Dana Dalquist. And then uh, back there's Jeff Benesek. Give a shout out to him. He's uh, on tour full time with our players, and um, he's a physical therapist. So he's a PT out there. Mm -hmm. So this is me capturing. Uh, Charles was in, he's working with Dana Dalquist and they've done a great job. And that's, uh, that's, that's that system. That's what we use. And that's where I get all those numbers that you saw the tour database comes, uh, out of that system there. And this is the gear system. Um, so that's uh, a lot of people are familiar with the gear system. So I've done a lot of work on gears as well. And that, it does the body, and it's fairly similar to AMM. We we work pretty hard trying to get it fairly similar. The wrist angles aren't quite as similar, so I've kind of uh, you know they're they're still good, and people can can use them, but they're not going to match up to my database. Uh, they're just a little bit uh, uh, different, and so I've stick I stick to the AMM for my full body stuff, and I've used a lot of the club. Uh, you know, research that I've done for the TPT product, TPT shafts, uh, on that gears system. Got some questions here. Mike says, how does wrist flex relate to ball flight? How does wrist flex relate to ball flight? So what we'd say is if you're going in and you're flexing and extending, so when you're first coming down and you're flexing the wrist, you're closing the club face, turning it down, and then as you go through, and that club face starts to square up towards the target and you're adding that extension, you're actually adding loft to the club. And there's something a lot of people don't talk about. Um, I look at all the time is actually the rate in which that face is changing. The loft is changing. And I think you'll hear more about that coming uh, in the future really soon. Um, so as you're extending that lead wrist you're actually turning the club to the left so you're rotating it to the left if you're a right-handed player closing it and you're adding loft so again it's it's not the position it's the motion so different players with different uh grips are going to uh come into the ball you can be leaning the shaft you know you know 10 to 15 degrees on a say a five iron and have your arm or you see your lead wrist in extension so it's a matter of the matchup of where it is before but the actual motion of extending will be right through impact will be closing the club face as well as adding loft so i mean it's going to affect the ball flight in that way um, it just depends on when or where you are at impact tom is asking is there radio flexion at address is there what Radial flexion at address. Radial, radial deviation. deviation. So when you're standing up over it, yeah, I mean, you would be standing down. Most players, I mean, the shorter the club, <laughs> the more it might end up. So there's certainly some players with a little bit of radial. You would find most of them go back to um, that previous slide with the database on there, the, the AMM graphs. 
and you'll kind of see a standard deviation and that'll answer his question exactly Just so right there so you're looking at a dress and there on the lead rest see that deviation it's 42 degrees in ulnar okay so ulnar is above that line and radial is below it okay so if you look at the database 68 percent of the of the players are between 32 degrees of ulnar and 45 degrees of ulnar so to be an actual radial deviation you have to have your hands pretty low and uh you know i've seen a couple of players do it but they would be such an outlier i would change them probably immediately but i wouldn't want uh that uh any radial deviation so much at address and where does Deschambault fit into all this? Um, I haven't captured him on AMM, so I don't know. Can't say. I'd say he's uh, um, very much so an owner at address. He would definitely be out of that range. He would be an outlier, so he'd be, you know, well above 45 degrees of owner, I would think. Um, but I don't. I've never captured him, so I can't say for sure. But you know, he's really owner deviating. Uh, at the top just keep in mind radial deviation does not happen a you know ton uh, during the golf swing it's at the top of the swing um, and a little bit after but most players are dumping that uh, radial deviation into owner pretty quickly and that's certainly on those two graphs you can see towards impact that uh, curve is going pretty straight up so that's a, a high velocity of movement right there any other questions from anybody? John, where can, where can um, our audience uh, reach you? How can we contact you if they want to get involved with some of the stuff that you're doing? I can certainly go to my website, SinclairGolf.com. And then uh, if they want to watch that video, he's putting it in right there. You can find it right there. You can go to the contact page. And my email's on there. But if you go to that pro shop right there, go to pro shop. Go to products right there. And then there's that video right there. You can just add that to the cart. And then in that code, get a pen right now. And if you can always uh, email me and I'll give you. So in that uh, coupon code at the bottom there, you just put in JSVM. Just type it for everybody so they can see it. VM99. And then to make sure and just push that green mark next to that uh, box and that activates that code and you'll get $50 off that video and it's two and a half hours. And uh, I think there's a lot of good information in there. Um, I go from A to Z um, on the wrist angles, both hands. So you'll have uh, both hands on there. And what I do is I go through each motion individually. And then I have you put the hands together and show you how they work uh, in unison. So hopefully everybody will like that that does it. I've already had, you know, tons and tons of people get it. And uh, um, so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's well worth the value there for our audience to understand that the last thing you want to do in the downswing is kind of hold that lag. And that's what everybody's trying to do. And that's why they get so extended on the way down and there's a pretty good section that i show in there with the wrist angles and what i call bad lag and good lag kind of what we discussed earlier well i'll tell you what this was very very informative very informative it's amazing all the study and everything you know i'm, I'm more the kind of guy uh that you know i i grew up in the old school <laughs> you know get rid of the golf club and get it out in front of you in a hurry you know, so we weren't trying to lag it or anything. You know, that was when we could square the club face up to get the golf club out in front of you in a hurry. Yeah, well, actually, that that little bit of lag that I described helps you do that. To be in all honesty, when you right. when you can drop that mass behind your hand force, and then as soon as you turn the corner, it's going to aid you. It's not an automatic. It's it's a passive torque, but it's going to aid throwing that club out in front of you. It's going to really help. So it makes it easier. I've yet to have somebody swing one-handed with either hand, doesn't matter, that didn't drop the mass behind the hand force because they, you know, you're weak, right? So you're doing it with one hand. So you figure out the easiest way to swing, swing the club around and square the face uh, one-handed and you'll do it every time. 
I haven't seen anybody not do it. I only see them not do it when they grab it with both hands and start muscling it. Um, but that's a that's something that Dr. Sasha McKenzie and I did a, a lot of captures of one-handed people uh, swinging both ways. And when he would run the numbers, they all would drop that mass under their hand force when they would swing it one-handed. And that goes for the guy shooting 120 to the best tour player on the planet. Well, Chico, this guy I used to take lessons from, Chico Miortes, he used to have us do one, one-arm one drills, and he would claim that the, the purpose of the one-arm drill is you had freedom of wrist motion. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I know I, know I do a lot of one-handed drills. My, my uh, buddy Tyler Farrell, who's a, a good 3D guy as well, he does a lot of one-arm drills. I work with Jeff Leishman. Um, tons of one-arm drills. I mean, we've done a lot of work to see that those one-arm drills really, really pay off for our clients. All right, anything else, Darren? If not, we'll call it a night. Uh, just, uh, I want to say thanks again. We're very grateful. We know how valuable your time is and to spend it with us. Um, we couldn't be more uh, excited about tonight. So thanks again. And that discount well, code is JSVM99. JSVM99. Remember that. JSVM99. Yep, JSVM. And if you have trouble, you can contact me, and I'll give it to you uh, over the uh, email, or, and you can always reach me there. I'm always around, and I really appreciate you guys having me. And uh, wrist angles is a tough thing to, to put across the airwaves, so if you got questions, always feel free to ask. Thank you. You demand. Awesome. Good night, Thanks, everyone. John. Don't forget quickfixgolf.com. Thank you, Bobby, Darren, and John. Appreciate it. Okay, well, y'all have a wonderful evening.